quick introduction. My name is uh, Jeff Hunter. I am with VMware. I am a uh, systems engineer with a specialty focus on business continuity and disaster recovery. So I spend a lot of time talking about things such as Site Recovery Manager, VMware Data Recovery, uh, VMware's HA, NFT, and our vSphere stack, and so on and so forth there. Um, as I'm sure you know, today's topic is VMware Data Recovery. Uh, pretty much everything you need to know. I'm sure I left a couple little things out, but uh, hopefully we cover at least 80 or 90 percent of what you're hoping to hear about. Uh, certainly we can take questions after the fact as well. There's two microphones, uh, one in either aisle way here, so if you do have a question, don't be afraid to stand up, raise your hand and whatnot. Um, you know, if, if it's a long-winded uh, answer that is, that is likely to come up, uh, I, I might ask you to hold that until after the session, but uh, otherwise hope you enjoy this here. So I've got some, uh, some good news and some bad news. Uh, I'll start with the bad news. Bad news is there are a lot of slides in this presentation, and I'm sure you've seen quite a few already. Good news is I'm not a fan of slides with lots of text on them. So these are mostly screenshots and diagrams and whatnot, which uh, hopefully will be much better than looking at some of uh, the eye charts maybe you've seen uh, earlier this week or earlier today. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. The obvious disclaimer, not even going to spend time with that one. Introduction, here are the items we're going to cover today, right? So to kind of preface this conversation, I, in, in my opinion, from a technical standpoint, there are really three facets to business continuity. Like I said, in the IT space there, uh, one of those is disaster recovery. The other is high availability. And of course, the third item is uh, data protection, right? We can have all the availability and disaster recovery that we want built into an environment, but if we have no way of protecting our data, backing it up, in other words, uh, not going to do us much good when we, when we recover that server quickly with SRM, right? If it doesn't have any data or it's bad data or corrupt data, then what use is it? So uh, my point there is that you need all three of these items, in my opinion, to be covered in a, in a true business continuity plan within the IT uh, uh, environment there. So what we're going to cover here a little bit is, is, number one, data protection is part of business continuity, as I just mentioned. We'll, we'll hit on the components of VDR. Uh, we'll also talk about what's new in VDR 2.0. So as, as I'm sure you know, we released uh, vSphere 5 here not too long ago. The, ca the code is available for download now, uh, so you can get your hands on this code. And with that vSphere 5 release, uh, we introduced VMware Data Recovery 2.0. Quite honestly, there are not a bunch of game-changing features and functionality that's been added. Uh, just a couple small things, but uh, one of the big things we've improved is, is stability and also performance a little bit. So uh, if maybe you tried data recovery uh, back in the 1.x days and you were like, well, this works pretty good, but maybe not exactly what I was looking for, or maybe you encountered a few issues with it, no secret there, uh, give it another try, okay? We've made some improvements there underneath the covers, and uh, hopefully you'll be pleasantly surprised and, and impressed. We'll cover installation and configuration, so if you have not uh, used data recovery before, I'm going to show you a little bit around how it's set up, and, and quite honestly, if you have done it before, you're thinking, well, it's pretty easy to do, and, and you know what? That's the beauty of it. I'm, I'm a big fan of keeping it simple, uh, and that's exactly what we did with data recovery. It's pretty darn easy to get this appliance up and running and start doing backups literally within minutes uh, within your infrastructure there. Last thing we'll cover, and probably the, the most interesting part, are, are some guidelines and some details around this product, right? Maybe some of the things that uh, aren't necessarily in the manual, or maybe a few things that, uh, uh, that, that we've found through experience versus things we've read, right? So uh, we'll cover some of those as well. So, so real quick, data, data protection, crucial to business continuity. As I mentioned before, data is king. We can have all the servers, fast, large, whatever it might be in the world, but again, it's really the data that counts. We can even have lots of great applications, but if we don't have the data protected, not going to do us any good. You know, the big reason, right, that we, we need availability is, is that cost of downtime. And that can range from hundreds of dollars to literally millions of dollars. And I posed the question in the session yesterday, and I'll pose it again just out of curiosity. Uh, anyone in the audience, ha have you actually had the opportunity to measure what the actual cost of downtime is to your organization? Anybody willing to speak up on that? Yes, sir. So, so that's a dead ringer right there. So the answer up here up front was, you know, it, it can be infinite because not only are you losing money when downtime occurs, but if your customers are depending on you to be there and you are not there, then the confidence is lost in your business as well. What do they do? They go to the competition potentially, right? So you could lose an insurmountable amount of money. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Anyone? Over here, yes, sir. $600,000 an hour. 
That's, that's, a big, that's the biggest number I've had so far. Granted, this is only the second time I've run this session, but in the, uh, the conversations yesterday, I think, um, I think it was around $60,000 that took the cake yesterday. What about back here in the back? You'll have to yell a little bit, please. Yeah, it could be your job, which is ultimately the most important, right? Yes, it could be, could be a resume updating opportunity for some folks, correct? So uh, yeah, I think we've, I think we've you know, beat that dead horse to, to death, but uh, again, it's very important. Compliance is another reason, right? And uh, I've got that last bullet point on there, sort of unrelated, but um, you know, believe it or not, I've talked to several customers that are like, well, you know, yeah, we should probably back some stuff up, but we're replicating to a second site, so we've got a backup copy. Of course, my question back to them is, okay, if you've got corrupt data in your primary data center and you replicate that corrupt data to that secondary data center, what do you have? Corrupt data in both places. So again, you have to have both, right, for business continuity there. So the solution obviously is, uh, and, and for this particular discussion here, is VMware Data Recovery. Obviously there are lots of um, options out there for backing up and recovering virtual machines. Uh, the good news is data recovery is included with all versions of vSphere except Essentials. So if you're running any, any licensing uh, mode above uh, Essentials, you have VMware Data Recovery. So if you're looking for a solution, this might be the bill. Uh, what I do want to preface as well in, in complete transparency is this is probably not going to be a replacement for an enterprise level backup tool. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that this is going to be a replacement for a, a tool that will back up, you know, maybe thousands of, of machines, right? Probably not the case. If you're backing up that many virtual machines, there's a pretty good chance you're going to need something a little more robust. So uh, just keep that in mind. But again, this, this product does scale fairly well, and we'll talk about that as far as specific numbers here shortly. So, so real quick, just to help you understand what this is, it's literally a virtual appliance and a vSphere uh, client plugin. Those are really the only two components uh, that you need in order to utilize this, this product, right? It's built, built on the, the VMware uh, vStorage APIs for data protection. I'm only going to say that once. I'm definitely going to go to the acronym on that one, V8AP for short, right? Uh, this is really just an API that VMware created uh, actually back in vSphere 4 to, to replace VCB. Do we have any VCB fans in the audience? Oh, we got one. I'm, su I'm surprised. No, no offense, if it's working for you, great, right? But not VMware's finest moment. So we realized the need to improve VMware consolidated backup. Uh, we decided to just flat out replace it instead of improve it. So uh, uh, that's what the APIs are for. The beauty of it is it's agentless, so you no longer have to install agents inside of each of your virtual machines. And again, I'll, I'll put a little asterisk after that comment there. There may be certain situations where it makes sense to continue to put an agent inside of your virtual machine, right? For example, if you are backing up something like a mission critical database, a SQL server, or something along those lines, you may need a very specific quiescing mechanism in order to go down there and get down to the to, you know, VSS, for example, to trunk the logs of that SQL server database or that exchange server, right? So in some cases, it may still make sense to go ahead and put an agent inside of that VM, uh, but for uh, most of your workloads out there, you can get away from having to manage that on a, on a VM by VM basis, right? Also, nice thing about uh, VMware data recovery, is, is bullet point number four, backup occurs regardless of the VM power state. So if you have a, an agent that you're putting inside of the virtual machines right now and you're doing backups that way, obviously the virtual machine has to be on in order for the backup solution to talk to that agent, right? Well, with this particular solution here, if the virtual machine is powered off, it still gets backed up. Now, how often do we sit around with virtual machines powered off? Not very often, but in the rare case where you do have that situation, good news is you'll still get a backup there. Data is deduplicated, so it's going to be uh, very, uh, very efficient from a space utilization standpoint. We, uh, we back up everything to a, a disk type of target. We do not back up to tape. It's not supported, uh, only to disk. But that, uh, that data store is deduplicated, and I think I have a screenshot in here a little bit later on specific numbers of really how efficient that mechanism is. It's pretty darn impressive. Uh, best thing, again, I mentioned earlier that, that I like to keep it simple, and, and again, that's the beauty of this product. It's, it's wizard-driven, it's GUI-based, it's very easy to set up a backup job, it's very easy to restore as well. So what's new in VDR2? I also teased this a little bit earlier, mentioning really that this is not a, a, a earth-shattering release here with tons of new functionality and all that good stuff. Uh, most of the improvement is under the covers. However, I think the key thing that we added is email reporting. So we can finally configure VMware Data Recovery to send us some kind of a report, right? A status report, if you will, on, on what's going on, on with, our, with our backup jobs there. So we can get that. Uh, we can also suspend and resume 
backup jobs. So if for some reason you need to stop a backup job for occurring for a couple days, you don't have to go in and delete it and then recreate it. You can just suspend it until you need to start that thing back up again, okay? I'll also have the ability to schedule a maintenance window. So for those that are familiar with data recovery and have used that already, you are probably familiar with the integrity check that occurs uh, on a regular basis with data recovery, I think by default every seven days or so, and after certain other events that happen within the environment as well. Uh, good news is, is now we can schedule that within a window, right? Usually opposite of what your backup window is. Uh, I think I have a few screenshots on that as well. I, I mentioned the performance thing already. And then uh, that, that bullet point toward the bottom, more resilience against uh, network failure, that's primarily in the SIFS environment. With VMware Data Recovery uh, 1.x, we certainly had some challenges around using SIFS as a target for these backups, especially if the network would uh, hiccup just a little bit or performance was poor uh, on that SIFS share, VMware Data Recovery would kind of throw its hands up in the air and error out at that point. Uh, we've improved it, it's not perfect, right? It, it's only so, uh, so impervious to those types of things, but certainly better than, than versions uh, previous. Swap files are no longer included as well. Let's not back them up, but I, that's, that's a no-brainer in my book. Next slide, there we go. So components, starting to get into some of the pictures. I mentioned I'm trying to limit the amount of text up there. So just to give you an idea, really, of what this looks like, we have that appliance up there. It's an OVF. It's a Linux-based virtual machine. Uh, CentOS, if I remember correctly. I, actually, I need to commit that to memory because I get that asked quite a bit. Uh, as a footnote, backup happens full the first time, so you get a full backup, of course, naturally, uh, but then from that point forward, it is incremental forever from there on out, okay? Uh, you can also do file level restores of the virtual machine. A couple other things to note, too, is that we support VSS, okay, to a limited level, if you will. Uh, depends, of course, on the operating system and some of the providers that are within the VM. There's a VSS uh, uh, mechanism within VMware tools, so depending on what you have in there, you may get file level quiescing, but some application level quiescing uh, happens as well. I'll show you a few screenshots around that, so it just depends on, on what you've got set up there. Uh, really kind of the secret sauce is change block tracking, CBT for short. Uh, again, we implemented this with vSphere 4. It, it, it is still in place, of course, with vSphere 5. And this is what enables us to, to quickly back up virtual machines because with change block tracking, we understand at the virtual machine level which blocks have changed within those VMDKs, right? So that way we don't have to back up the entire virtual machine every time or put a lot of load on that virtual machine as an agent does that type of work for us, right? It all happens within the, the, uh, the vSphere layer. So very nice feature there. Destination, you have some flexibility. I mentioned SIFS a little bit ago. Of course, you can use a VMFS partition or a VMFS volume, and NFS is supported as well. All of those data stores are going to be deduplicated. And last but not least, there is a plugin that goes into your vSphere client to, uh, to get this moving for you, right, to set everything up. And all wizard-driven, it is HA-aware, so it will understand, uh, you know, if there is a failure, it will understand where that virtual machine is because VMware Data Recovery talks to vCenter. That's one of the first things it does before it starts a backup, so it knows the location of that virtual machine, even if you vMotion it as well. So, again, pretty cool functionality there. Configuration-wise, this is really all it takes to get this set up and running. There's an ISO that you will download. And, and the reason I mention this is, again, this is something that, that a lot of folks will ask me. They're like, well, I've, I've downloaded vSphere. I, I can't find data recovery, right? And there's actually a separate download for that particular ISO there. Uh, that ISO, though, contains everything that you need to set this up. So it has the OVF appliance in there and, of course, all the necessary uh, bits and bytes, too, for file level restores. You can see maybe on the lower uh, right-hand screen there, my apologies to the folks in the back, probably a little bit small. I tried to, tried to make it large enough, but there's like a Linux file level restore folder and also a Windows one as well. And then, of course, the plugin for the vSphere client itself. So there's a quick screenshot uh, of deploying that, that OVF, deploy, uh, OVF appliance. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, with, with vSphere uh, 4.1 and earlier, there are various block sizes, as I imagine most of you know, uh, that you can, you can deploy your VMFS par, uh, volumes with. Uh, it's important to, to make sure that we put um, the, the uh, data recovery appliance on the VMFS data store with the largest block size. And I honestly don't have all the details of exactly why that's supposed to happen, but that's mainly for compatibility purposes. My understanding is, is if you try to back up uh, virtual machines with larger block sizes on other VMFS volumes, you may run into issues there. So again, deploy that, uh, that OVF to the, the VMFS partition with the largest block size. Uh, with vSphere 5, uh, the good news is there, there's only one block size, if it's a new partition, right? So uh, just a couple things to keep in mind around deploying that, that OVF. 
At this point, we will add uh, backup destinations. You can do one or two, so max of two, in other words. Uh, there are some, some, some minimums and maximums to, to keep in mind here. Uh, the numbers that I have up there are really kind of uh, uh, middle of the road guidelines, right? So we can actually go up to two terabytes, but in my opinion, I think it's better to stay around one terabyte for, uh, for just for stability purposes, maybe around 500 gig on a, on a SIF share. Uh, but again, you can go larger than that. It's larger, uh, larger sizes are supported. And of course, this is all documented within the, the various document, documentation with, uh, with BDR. Um, minimum of 10 gig in size as far as a, as a backup target there. Uh, obviously, you're not going to be able to back up a whole lot if it's that small. But again, just something to keep in mind if you're just going to back up a couple VMs. Make sure you at least size that 10 gig or larger, right? Also, best practice is to use a, a thickly, thick, not thin, provision disk. Uh, so that way you don't uh, suffer any performance hits uh, if VDR is trying to back up a lot of data at one time and we need to grow that VMDK file, right? So, uh, so make sure that uh, uh, you use a, a thickly provisioned disk there. In my example, it's grayed out because I'm going to NFS. So once you power on the VDR appliance, uh, if you look directly at the console, you don't have a whole lot of options there. There's configure network, login, uh, set time zone. Uh, pretty important, make sure you set the correct time zone for your VDR appliance. Uh, you could run into issues if your, your vCenter server and your VDR appliance are of different time zones there, so uh, something to keep in mind as well. And then, of course, you can, you can log into this particular appliance as well uh, to you know, update the, the password. I did put the default password right up here in, in this slide because that is another frequently asked question is, where the heck do I find the default password? So uh, if you're deploying this, uh, you, you'll have a, a copy of this slide deck. Hopefully here in a few weeks, you can, you can look there as well to find that, that password. Use a static IP address and make sure DNS is set up properly. Uh, that's always been a best practice in a VMware environment to make sure that DNS is rock solid. Short name, long name, both directions, right? Uh, no exception here. Make sure you've got DNS set, uh, set up properly. There's also a web interface uh, to the VDR appliance, and this is really what you should probably use to manage that appliance once you have it deployed there. Uh, you can see network settings, version numbers, uh, obviously your host name and the ability to reboot that appliance. Also note that there is a, a port number on the end of that URL. Uh, 5480 is that port number. I've, I've seen a number of people forget to tack that onto the end of the URL, and of course then it comes up empty, and they're like, what the heck? And I'm like, well, put 5480 on the end of that, and then they're good to go. So again, just a footnote there. And that, that port number, by the way, cannot be changed. Uh, there's what the plugin looks like. Again, it's added uh, as, a, as a single icon underneath uh, solutions and applications there. And then, of course, when you click on that, you'll, you'll see information similar to what is shown there at the bottom of the slide, right? So uh, you'll have various things you can click on to make uh, configuration changes and, and, and information about the appliance itself, such as IP address, version number, and so on and so forth. And then we go ahead and recreate, we create, I'll try that again, say, uh, say that three times fast, our, our, um, our first backup job here. Uh, but before we do that, we need to do a quick configuration of the appliance. It's three easy steps, as you can see here. Uh, credentials for vCenter there. We need to add a, a backup destination. So you'll attach that data store, or those VMDK files in advance, of course, before you power on that, that virtual appliance. We'll select that. Notice in the, uh, in the screenshot there, hopefully you can see that in the back underneath status, kind of in the middle of the screen there, that it's unmounted. If for some reason uh, you cannot create your first backup job, Chances are you don't have your destination mounted because it's not done by default. You have to go in there and actually mount that destination by right clicking on it or whatever. Uh, there's also a mount uh, link in the upper right hand corner. Uh, configuration is complete at that point. Uh, by the way, if you're upgrading, okay, so we'll stop here for a second. And, and if you are an existing VDR user, these are the steps you should follow to upgrade any existing VDR implementation that you have. Uh, this is in the release notes. Uh, but I added a couple of things which I think are a good idea. For example, step number one, I think before you do anything else, it's a pretty darn good idea to run an integrity check, right? Good news is uh, these run faster. For those that have used VDR in the past, you're probably like, oh, geez, that's going to take forever to do that right there, right? Uh, good news is not quite as long this time. We've improved that a little bit. It still takes some time, depending on how big of a uh, destination data store that you have out there. Uh, but again, it's a little faster than it used to be. So, so do, that, uh, do that integrity check, make sure it finishes out, close the client, remove the old plugin, and then install the new plugin right off of that ISO we talked about. Uh, make sure there are no operations running, so no maintenance activities, no backups, no restores, anything like that. Unmount the destinations, and then uh, make sure that when you go to get rid of that appliance that you do not delete from disk. 
because I, I think we all know what happens there. When you delete from disk, it wipes out any VMDKs that are attached to that virtual machine, including your destination data stores, which means our backups are gone. So make sure you do not delete from disk, remove from inventory only. Uh, speaking of that, as a footnote, uh, it's good to know that everything we need for data recovery, except for the appliance, of course, is in that destination data store. So the question is, is that appliance disposable for the most part? And, and the answer is, yeah. Yeah, for some reason that appliance is corrupted or gets deleted by accident or whatever the case might be, you can simply deploy a new appliance, attach it to an existing uh, destination data store, and everything you need, including your backup jobs, configuration, and of course the data itself is all self-contained inside of that data store. So those appliances, they're, they're really disposable at that point. You can throw them away and just deploy new ones and, and you know, do your backups and restores if you want to. Um, Finish out the getting started wizard as you continue through your upgrade here. Do not format, obviously, because obviously we'll lose data there. Uh, you'll get a prompt that'll ask you to restore configuration. So in other words, your backup jobs and then you know, your email reporting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, click yes to that. And then once that's done, I would go ahead and do yet another integrity check just to make sure, a before and after, right? To make sure we're good to go. Again, this is in the release notes. And my advice, again, Make sure you read documentation here. I've, I've run into so many customers that, you know, it's always exciting to get the technology deployed. I know we're all short on time, um, but I think it's a worthwhile practice regardless of which product you are deploying or working with. Read those release notes, guys. Take a look at those release notes, read the documentation, then do the deployment. It's gonna save you headaches down the line. So let's create that backup job I mentioned, right? You click on, click on the backup tab, click new, um, best practice here. Give it a good name because that name is obviously going to appear in the interface, but also in logs and reports as well. So if you give it a cryptic name and somebody asks to see the details of that backup job, they're gonna like throw their hands up in the air wondering what BR549 stands for, right? Let's, let's call it marketing instead or something like that. As you go through the wizard to create that backup job, you'll see the, uh, the opportunity there to, to add virtual machines. Uh, you can add individual virtual machines. You can even add individual VMDK files if you want to. So if you only need to back up one, one of the VMDK files of a VM that has two or three or whatever the case might be, you can get to that granularity level if you want to. Uh, you can also go on a bigger scale, right? So maybe you can specify an entire folder of virtual machines. So maybe that marketing department we just mentioned has 12 virtual machines as part of that instead of click, click, click 12 times, right? Let's just put all those guys inside of a uh, you know, like a, a cluster in of itself or a resource pool, whatever the case might be, and we can, we can choose that entity instead. And of course, the nice thing is, is when we add additional virtual machines to that container, if you will, those automatically start getting backed up as well. So that's, that's a better way to manage that in most cases. You'll also need to specify the backup destination. Uh, obviously, if you only have one, one choice there, but if you have two backup destinations, pick which one you want to go with. And then uh, at that point, we, we continue here. We have a, a backup window definition screen. Uh, this is actually pretty simple too. You, you literally click on those blocks right there to, to define whether uh, either you run the backup job at that point in time or you do not run the backup job at that point in time. Uh, here's, here's a pretty typical uh, um, you know, backup schedule here, Monday through Friday, right? I think it's like uh, six or 7 a.m. until five in the afternoon, something like that. If you get really bored, uh, you, can, you can make words. Uh, with the backup scheduler. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Go Buckeyes. So that's why OSU's up there. We also have to specify a retention policy as well. So how long do we need to keep these backups around? Again, very simple. Just a few choices here. A uh, few more uh, many and custom is really what you have out of the gate. Of course, with custom, you can specify other uh, other individual, you know, individual settings there toward the bottom. Probably a little tougher to read back there. But again, the, the point here, guys, it's simple. It's simple, and that's the beauty of it. I like it. Um, if by chance when you finish the, the, the finish, or when you click the finish button here and you are inside of that backup window, the backups will actually start at that point in time. So if, if you said, yeah, this is an okay time to start backing up, that will initiate at that point in time. Um, if for some reason it is outside of the backup window, but you're like, yeah, I wanna go ahead and get that first backup started, do it manually, in other words, you have the option to do that as well. You can right click on the backup job. And you have two options, all sources. So in other words, back up everything, regardless of whether it's been backed up within the past 24 hours or not. And then of course you can also back up uh, out of date sources, which is anything that has not been backed up in the past 24 hours. What about restores, right? Again, backups look pretty easy. Um, I think it's no secret that anybody can do backups, right? It's kind of what separates the men from the boys and, and ladies in the audience, no offense there. Anybody can back up, but it's the pros that, that can do the restore, right? And that's where the real value is. 
got to be able to do restoration. So we, we, we tried to make that as easy as possible as well. Again, you, you simply start through a wizard there. Uh, you can pick an individual VMDK file or a virtual machine or whatever makes sense. And you can also pick containers. Uh, as a footnote, so I'm going to bounce back just for a second. You may have many options underneath here as well. I don't know if, again, the folks in the back, hopefully you can see this, but there are several dates and times there. And of course, that's going to depend on what your uh, retention policy is. And of course, how many backups you've run up to that point as well. In this case here, I've got five different uh, dates and times. And of course, that will vary depending on, again, those items I mentioned earlier. Pick whichever one you want, move forward through there. Uh, you have several options when it comes to restoring as well. Uh, you can pick which data store that you want to put that virtual machine on, also what uh, virtual disk node, so which SCSI address, right? That zero colon one, zero colon five, whatever. Uh, you can rename the virtual machine if you want to. You can choose to restore configuration or not. What I mean by that is do, do you want to restore the entire VM, including the VMX file, all the settings that go along with that, or do I need just the data, the VMDK files, right? Uh, you, can, you can choose to have the NIC connected once it is, uh, once it is restored or you can have it disconnected for obvious reasons. And, and same thing with, uh, with the power operation as well. You can either choose to leave it powered off or you can have it powered on as soon as the restoration is complete. Uh, something else, uh, you know, I mentioned just a few moments ago that really, you know, anybody can do backups. We should all be doing that. But, the, but what really counts is when we can do restores. Uh, just like a disaster recovery plan, right? We always hear about folks saying, well, we should test our disaster recovery plan to make sure that it works. We should do that frequently. Uh, you know, backups and restores are no exception, so we have a functionality built in that is called restore rehearsal from last backup. You can literally uh, right click on, on the, the virtual machine there and go through the, the practice, if you will, of making sure that that VM can actually be restored. So we make it quite easy to do that, just a couple of clicks. What about file level restore, right? We've been talking about uh, image level restore up to this point. Good news is, as well, with uh, Windows and Linux VMs, we can also do file level restore. There are a couple of folders on that ISO that contain the, the executables, if you will, uh, to, to perform that. There's a, there's a screenshot there of the bot at the bottom when you first click on the Windows version of that. What you get, you connect to the data recovery appliance, and then you'll be able to move forward from there, uh, selecting a restore point, right? So again, depending on how many backups have occurred and what our retention policy is, you pick the restore point out there, and then you mount that. And, and, and what's nice about this, again, is if you know how to use Windows, which, again, I think most people do, including end users, right, uh, then they can, they can easily do re restores here. Uh, so you browse through that particular restore point, and then you literally copy and paste. As you can see at the top of the window there, hopefully you can anyway, uh, the, the, the root uh, mount point for the restore is the, the current date and time. So, so you'll see that at the top. You can find the file that you're looking for, right click on that file, copy, and then paste it onto your C or your D drive or whatever makes sense there. So again, it's all Windows functionality. You don't have to do anything fancy or any kind of an oddball GUI. We can just use a classic copy and paste, right, to get that, that, that older file uh, out, of that, out of that backup. For the Linux folks out there, uh, you get similar functionality, although it's not GUI, it's command line, of course. Um, keep in mind there are actually uh, two executable files, if you will. There is one with a lowercase v, so VDR file restore with a lowercase v. There's one with uppercase as well. Make sure you use the uppercase v as it's a wrapper that contains some additional items in there to make sure that that, that file level restore works properly. Uh, when I was working with this uh, as, as part of creating this presentation here, I actually ran into an error uh, on an Ubuntu machine. I uh, ran into a fuse error, so I had to, uh, to install fuse to make that work. Uh, good news is there was a, a knowledge base article out there that, that made it very easy for me to find that solution. So, you know, case in point, lesson learned here. Uh, guys, don't forget about uh, the, the knowledge base that VMware has out there. Uh, it has a ton of information. More often than not, when I look there or when I talk with customers that look out there, they find what they're looking for. And there's also the VMware forums as well. Uh, if you're not a forum user or at least a browser at this point, I encourage you to look out there. I think it's one of the best forums for any IT uh, technology out there is, is, you know, as far as the user community is concerned. So a lot of times you can find those answers out there. Anyway, going down through there, screenshot there again, showing that the, uh, the root mount point Again, shows the, the, the date and time. And then, of course, you can literally just copy that file from there back over into your, your running virtual machine then. We also have an advanced mode for file level restore. Um, you know, I, it's kind of funny. I mentioned this in the last section, uh, session that I did yesterday. Um, you know, I just showed you how easy it is to do file level restore. It's very natural, maybe even for some end users. So I'm just going to throw it out there. Think about the possibility of end users actually be able to restore, being able to restore some of their own files, right? Everybody's like, yeah, right, that ain't happening. <laughs> I 
but it could be done potentially, right, if you've got some savvy end users. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of sitting around and doing file restores all day. So again, food for thought. With this tool here, it might just be easy enough even for an end user. Uh, there is an advanced mode, though, for the administrators out there, which allows you to, uh, to actually go in there and, and mount multiple uh, you know, mount points, VMs, and so on and so forth, so you can really get crazy moving stuff around. What about the new stuff, right? I mentioned this already. Here's a, here's a screenshot that shows this a little bit more. Uh, we have the ability now to generate email reports and have them in your inbox, like at 7 a.m. every morning, Monday through Friday, if you want to go that route. Uh, really easy to configure, as you can see on the screen there. The, uh, the names have been uh, grayed out to protect the innocent. Simply just put your SM, uh, SMTP server information in there, authentication, and up to 10 email addresses. So you could have one, five, up to 10. Uh, can, folks can receive this report then on, on whatever schedule you decide to, uh, to enable. If you're curious as to what that uh, report looks like there, that's, that's really about the best screenshot I could do. There's a ton of data uh, in these reports. I, I highlighted them with the, with the blue bubbles there so you can see the, the appliance, right, so the versioning and what the name of the appliance is, uh, the various backup jobs that you have configured. Uh, you can also see destination data stores, right, so information around that, capacity, how much is used, and, and whether it's online or not ready to be used. Also, the virtual machines, how long it took to back those up, which is kind of cool. So for example, uh, again, for the folks that can't see the fine print, uh, my marketing department VM on its last backup, uh, since I had already done a full backup, this was an incremental, uh, took almost nine minutes, and that's about it. My, uh, my accounting department, which was a Linux VM, uh, actually only took about five minutes. So as you can see, once we get past that full backup, uh, the change block tracking mechanism is actually pretty darn efficient there. It only takes a few minutes to back up these virtual machines from that point forward. Again, that depends on how many changes occur within that VM, uh, but for the most part, it happens pretty quick. Last but not least, warnings and errors. There toward the bottom, uh, if you are having issues with the environment, you'll see some information around that. In my example, I had a power failure in my environment. My lab does not have any type of uh, generator or UPS or anything crazy like that. And a storm rolled through while I was uh, taking these screenshots here. Lost power for a moment. So it says, uh, task terminated, possibly due to power failure or system crash. So it'll give you some kind of hint as to what's going on. Good stuff. Just like we have a, uh, a maintenance scheduler, or a, I'm sorry, a backup window scheduler, we also have a, a maintenance window scheduler as well. And again, very simple, just like the, uh, and don't worry, I don't have any more OSU stuff or anything crazy like that, but it's just like the, uh, the backup job, uh, you know, blue to run, gray if you do not run it, want it to run, and in most cases, you'll probably set this opposite of your backup window, of course. There's a couple of jobs, too, that I'll mention. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about the integrity check uh, that, that occurs. Uh, that's just, again, to make sure that everything is stable, that, that you know, the indexes match the data and so on and so forth. Uh, we also have a reclamation job that occurs as well. And what happens there is every time that reclaim job runs, it takes a look at that retention policy. And if we have a, a backup that is aged out at that point, that reclamation job will go in there, and it will actually uh, mark those blocks as available for use in future uh, backup jobs, right? So, so our, our amount of data on disk will not necessarily shrink, right? So you won't see that the, the, the amount used go down, uh, but what will happen is, is VDR will attempt to reuse that reclaimed space in future backup jobs so it may not grow much either. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty good thing there as well with that, with that reclaimed job. I mentioned earlier that uh, you have the ability to suspend, and of course there it is in the GUI. Not much to say there other than we have it now. Good stuff. Uh, one, one thing to note, though, like the slide says, currently running tasks will not be affected. So if you have a backup job that's currently running and you, uh, you go to suspend that, it'll finish out. And then, of course, future jobs from that point will not run until you re-enable that job. Do you do performance? Uh, really the main highlight of this screen I'd mentioned earlier is, as far as the, the efficiency of the, the change block tracking and the deduplication and compression that occurs within BDR. Uh, again, kind of some fine print up there. Um, but I have a capacity of, of 98.7 gig, roughly 100 gig, in other words, that I'd, I'd configured for this particular uh, environment. Uh, backing up just a few virtual machines, uh, the deduplicated size, in other words, the amount of, of space that these, these backups are taking on disk right now, is a little over 6 gig. But the amount of data that I've actually backed up is the equivalent of 276 gig. So if you do a little bit of math there, you can see that that's pretty darn efficient. Even with that little 100 gig data store, I can back those virtual machines up and, and probably a whole lot more on top of that too and, and have a pretty uh, healthy retention policy. So that's how efficient that, uh, uh, that, that deduplication and, and change block tracking is. For those that are curious, I also included a screenshot of, of what the, the backup data store looks like. 
Uh, you'll see there are various uh, index files in there, slab files, and a few other odds and ends. Really not much to talk about there, uh, but again, the point being that everything needed to, to do backups and restores is contained within there. The appliance is, is just the part that does the work. So if we lose that appliance, we can simply attach a new appliance, and it will read the information inside of that, that backup destination to restore your backup jobs, configuration, and everything else that you need to keep right on trucking. So, good stuff. Tips, tricks, things, lessons learned, all that good stuff. Um, I'll start out at a high level here, right? So right out of the gate, and this is 101 stuff, but it's important. We need to understand retention policy, right? The reason I mention that is like compliance purposes, for example. There might be certain virtual machines which contain data that need to be saved for many months or maybe even five, seven, 10 years, whatever the case might be. So it's important as you plan your backup strategy that you understand that, right? Talk to the application owners and say, hey, how long do we need to do this? Do we need to back these up for a long time or can we just keep you know, a year's worth or what's, what's the deal here? And that's going to drive how many different backup jobs that you have, of course, in the environment, right? Uh, number two, I mentioned that one earlier, thoroughly read the, uh, the release notes and documentation. Again, make sure you understand it thoroughly before you deploy it, not after, right? Let's not retrofit here. Start with a few virtual machines as well. Um, even if you've used VDR in the past, uh, you know, just start with the few, get the feel of the new appliance, understanding what it can and can't do. Then once you have your, your best practices in place, then grow the environment and test regularly. I mentioned earlier, anybody can back VMs up, right? It, it's the pros that can restore. So make sure you test your restore. We've, we've got functionality built right into the product to do that. So, so make sure you do that and keep, keep log of it, right? So that way when, uh, when management comes and it's review time and, and he asks the oddball question, what about restores? Do you keep an eye on that? Oh yeah, absolutely. We do a restore rehearsal once a week on that particular mission critical application right there, and it's checking out great for us. So we're in good shape there, right? Keep the plug-in uh, about the same, or exactly the same, I should say, as the VDR appliance version. Um, I don't know necessarily that you'll run into issues uh, with 2.0. I, I simply haven't tested that yet, but I know with 1.x versions, uh, in some cases, when you had a different plug-in version from the appliance that you were running, uh, you would occasionally run into some oddball things that would happen there. So uh, again, make sure when you upgrade the appliance, upgrade the plug-in at the same time to avoid any issues there. Also keep in mind that each backup job runs once, as long as the backup window is open within a 24-hour period. Uh, you really can't get much more granular as far as how you schedule that other than using that backup window. Uh, so if you're backing up several VMs, your backup job starts at 6, that VM might get backed up at 6.15 or it might be 10.30 at night, just depends, right? So, uh, so there's not a ton of granularity as far as specifying exactly when other than through that backup uh, window scheduler. Uh, just a note too, for the folks that have not upgraded to vSphere 5, which I'm guessing is quite a few since it's relatively new, I think the code just dropped last week, right? Uh, good news is this 4.0 is supported later and, it, and later is supported. Um, also note that we can support up to 10 appliances. I mentioned scalability earlier. We can actually support up to 10 appliances per vCenter and each appliance can support up to 100 virtual machines. So if you do some quick math there, theoretically you could back up up to 1,000 virtual machines. Now, results will certainly vary, and as, as you start backing up more and more virtual machines, it might be a good idea uh, to run integrity checks uh, more often as well. I don't have that on the slide there, but just something to keep in mind. I think out of the gate by default, you can run an integrity, or it, I should say it, it runs uh, once every seven days. You can change that uh, with an advanced setting uh, you won't see the slide today, but in this slide deck, there's an appendix section that shows some of those advanced settings. You, you, you should uh, probably modify your integrity check to run more often if you're backing up a larger number of VMs, so maybe every three or four days, something along that line, okay? Uh, also note the, uh, the virtual machine hardware version. For those not uh, intimately familiar with VMware, we have various versions of hardware, and we're talking about the virtual hardware here. Uh, versions 4, 7, and 8 are supported. Uh, one thing to note, though, is that version 4 uh, does not work with change block tracking. So it has to be version 7 or higher. Can I back up virtual machines with version 4? Absolutely you can, but you're going to be pretty much doing a full backup every time with that, uh, uh, that VM virtual hardware uh, version 4. So go ahead and upgrade it. So right click. Uh, you have to install some VMware tools along with that. Again, I'm going to point you to the documentation on that for specifics, but uh, just something to be aware of. Uh, I, I would say use a VMDK file or an RE, RDM uh, for a destination. Again, SIFS is supported, but we don't have much control over the performance characteristics of the SIFS share, right? It's out, out of the VMware environment for the most part. Uh, so performance will vary, stability will vary. Uh, so if you have the ability to use, uh, you know, NFS, VMDK, or uh, RDM, I, I would go with that, uh, that option instead of SIFS, okay? 
Also note that uh, it's a good idea to back up uh, similar virtual machines uh, into the same uh, destination data store. Uh, for example, maybe uh, you know Windows machines in one destination, Linux in the other, because think about the deduplication thing, right? It, again, that happens at the block level, uh, but we can get a little more efficiency uh, if, if we point them to the same spot. Uh, last thing to mention too is VSS is supported, as I talked about earlier. Uh, there are details around that in the VDR guide. There's also a uh, an article out there, uh, probably several actually, on on Microsoft's site around that. Uh, but again, some level of VSS is supported, but not necessarily again to the level that you may need. So in some cases, you might still need to install some type of an agent uh, in your virtual machine to do you know, truly application consistent backups. So I promised earlier I'd show you a couple screenshots where VSS was in action. You can see the, uh, hopefully see the start times uh, in, the, in the upper left hand corner there. And then of course the, the event viewer log uh, in Windows where you can see that the volume uh, shadow copy service did, in, did indeed kick in right there. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the lower uh, screenshot there shows uh, an example from an exchange environment, too. So you can see there is some level of application quiescing even with uh, VMware data recovery. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, first uh, VM uh, backup is full. We talked about that. Use a static IP. I mentioned that one as well. I think the, uh, the good one on here, the two good uh, nuggets on here, actually, are, are when you open up an SR, and again, I'm guessing everybody here pretty much has done this at one time in the past, but always, always, always include logs as soon as you open that SR up. You, there's, there's, a, there's a place to upload logs as you open that SR on the website there. Uh, it's always a good idea to get those, those logs in the hands of VMware support as soon as possible. So when you open the SR, include the logs. There is a KB article that talks about gathering logs for VMware data recovery, which is noted up there as well. Again, you will have access to these slides at some point. There's also the ability within the GUI to look at additional logs by holding down the shift key, and then you can, uh, you can hit uh, logs there and see some additional logs as well within the GUI, as I mentioned. Archives. So I, I talked about earlier how tape is not supported, right? And there may be some cases where we need to retain this data for perhaps many years. And it's probably not a good place to retain that data on a destination data store, right? How, how can we archive this? Or, or maybe move it to an off-site location, something along that line for disaster recovery. And uh, the, the bad news is, is, is it's not currently supported within VDR to do this automatically. Uh, but there's a pretty easy manual method for doing that. And how that looks is you simply unmount your destination data store there. Then, as I mentioned, everything needed is contained within that data store to, to do uh, restores there. You would just simply add an appliance to that. And then uh, you can copy that to another site or, or off, you know, put it off to tape or, or whatever uh, it, it, as, as needed to, uh, to restore that, uh, that old data, if you will. I think it's a good idea, too, to keep a copy of the appliance around um, that you use to take those, those particular backups, right? Uh, my understanding is, is we are going to strive to make sure that future versions of VDR will be able to go back to older versions of, of uh, destination data stores. But again, you, you never know. There might be some little quirk that we miss or whatever the case might be. So I, I think personally it's a best practice to go ahead and keep a copy of that ISO, at least major versions, right? So 1.0, 2.0, and so on and so forth with that off-site backup, just in case you need an older version of that appliance as well. Key takeaways, guys. I, I, I mentioned this a handful of times already. Uh, you, you need data recovery to back things up, right? And, and to ensure that you can actually recover from a disaster. Replication's not enough. Uh, VDR enables easy, quick backups. Like, like I say, it's simple. That's the beauty of the product there. Easy to deploy and configure. Uh, we've got some good guidelines and best practices out there, not only in this slide deck here, but also in the manual as well. Make sure you look at that documentation. Start with a few VMs and then build the environment out as you get your best practices established. And that is it. I'll take questions. We've got mics on either side of the aisle there. Make sure you fill out those surveys too, please. Yes, sir, right down in front. I am 90% sure that's the case. So the question is, can I de deploy vSphere, or I'm sorry, VDR 2.0 on vSphere 4? And I haven't tested that officially, but I, I believe you can. I believe so. Another question, real quick. The limitation is still two data stores, yes. Uh, sir? Uh, the data that, oh, sorry. Question over here, yes. Yes. Uh, the data that basically is collected for the report, is that saved on the appliance or on the vCenter database? I believe most of that is in the logs for that appliance there. I, I'm not sure if it's in the data store or not for the email report specifically, is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah, for that That's data. That's a good question, I'm not sure. Just for reporting. And then if the vCenter is virtual, can we still back it up with this? One more time again. If a vCenter is virtual, can we back it up with this? 
Yes, great question there. So what if vCenter is a virtual machine, right? Um, number one, you can back up vCenter with VDR. I'm actually doing that in my environment. Uh, number two, it is not required to have vCenter in order to do a restore. You can actually connect directly awesome. to an ESX host. So that way, if you happen to lose your vCenter VM, you can still do restores with VDR. And are there any smart, so if I'm backing up, I don't know, 20 machines, I don't have the backup of all 20 machines starting at the same time, you know, killing my ESX hosts? Uh, it'll do up to eight VMs at a time. It just randomly, it randomly picks them? Yep. Okay, and the last one, I'll let them talk. Okay. Uh, if I am backing up my uh, backups to tape or something, I unmount it. You mentioned that when you reclamate a space, it doesn't actually make the, you know, we don't actually gain the storage back. So if I'm backing up to the tape, I am going to use more. Is there any way to tell it, okay, shrink at this point? Not, no, not built into the product. There's no way to actually uh, shrink that data store back down. Awesome, thank you. Question up front here, please. Uh, that's a best practice, yes. I think you can actually go higher than that. I, I, I can't remember offhand if they raise that limit uh, officially, but I would stick with 500 gig. Uh, how about over here, this microphone? Yeah, are there limitations of using uh, VDR with uh, high availability or fault tolerant servers? Uh, there, no, not that I'm aware of. There are no limitations there because, again, we're pulling, you know, so if you think about those two items, uh, HA I know for sure is supported. Fault tolerance, really, we're not changing anything at the VMDK level, so we can still do backups even though that VM is fault tolerant protected. Okay, if, uh, if my destination has deduplication already, can I disable deduplication on the... Uh, VDR side? No, there's no way to disable that, uh, at least in a supported fashion. There might be some kind of switch or something you can en enable, but uh, it's not going to hurt you to have both. Uh, it's not going to gain you any additional benefit by having both, right? Because you, you can't, you know, having dedupe on dedupe doesn't gain much, uh, but there's certainly no harm in doing that. I'm thinking CPU and or backup time. Yeah, you know, Maybe the overhead is, is... Very little? Yeah, pretty, pretty limited. Okay, and you mentioned an agent for doing um, backups of databases. Uh, you, you showed BSS. Is there another agent that you can install onto a database server? No, that's a good question. I probably could have should have clarified there a little bit more. So when I mentioned uh, still putting an agent inside of a, a virtual machine to do you know, specific application backups, that's certainly going to require another type of backup solution that utilizes agents. BDR has no agents to it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, how about over here? Yes, I, I am a current user of uh, BDR, uh -huh. and I've encountered uh, a number of problems with it, actually. Yep. Performance issues, right. stability issues, um, and the second thing is snapshots. Yes, they leave a lot of snapshots behind to yep. the point where it's brought down vCenter entirely. <laughs> wow, has that, that all been fixed? Uh, for the most part, yes. So there's a combination of improvements that have been been made. Obviously, some inside the VDR appliance, like I mentioned there, but also some improvements in vSphere as well around snapshotting and monitoring those types of things. So yes, uh, my advice, as I mentioned earlier, if you've tried uh, VDR 1.0 and was a little disappointed, um, give us another try, if you will. Okay. Another thing is on the, the integrity checks. Yes. Often I I have uh, backups that are corrupted. Yep. With consistency, they're corrupted, and and so basically backup stops. I'm glad to see the email coming in because now I at least know right. that the backup appliance is, is no longer backing up. Yep. Um, has that improved where data corruption is reduced um, or is that still an issue? No, a lot of that has been improved, right? So that's, that's a big chunk of what we did was underneath the covers there with VDR. There's mm -hmm. very, very little surface stuff that's been added other than really the yeah. email reporting. Okay. Uh, you're going to see an improvement in that space though, yes. Okay, good, thanks. I, there was a question up front here. Sir, did you have one? Or? If not, I can give you a minute. Or right behind you. Go ahead, sir. Yes. <laughs> It'll update. Yeah, I, I've heard of that issue there. So, so the question was, uh, when, when you open up the GUI, right, in, in 1.x version, sometimes everything would show up as, as source out of date, right? And then eventually it would correct itself. And the answer is yes, we've made improvements there as well. Uh, I haven't seen that issue so far in my use of, of VDR 2.0. No, use, use the plugin. The, the web interface, you're not going to be able to set up backups or anything like that in the appliance. You're definitely going to have to use the plugin. That's just for basic configuration of the appliance itself. Networking, rebooting, those kind of things. Yes. Right. <coughs> Got your question? Yeah. 
hang, hang, fo hang tight, folks, here at the mics. Uh -huh. You could. Don't have the courage to get your ass up. Mm. I mean, we can hear the freaking question. Right. It's really lazy ass. Yeah, exactly. So, so the comment up here was, you know, that, that destination data store, since we cannot back up directly to tape, you know, we talked about archiving purposes, right? Why couldn't we simply just copy the contents of that over someplace else or to a tape or whatever the case might be? And the answer to that is, is actually you can. It, it can be that simple. Just make sure you unmount that data store first to make sure it's completely consistent and stable at that point. How about over here? Uh, Array-based replication. Yes. and the mount unmount. So let's say I do array-based replication of the backup volume that's attached to an appliance at primary site. Yep. Coming up on DR site using vSphere Heartbeat, what, am I gonna get a clean mount if it wasn't clean, if it wasn't cleanly unmounted at the source but it just has continuous replication? Is it gonna be dirty, clean? Um, if, if you did not un unmount that destination data store before you did replication to your secondary site, there are no guarantees that that will be a consistent copy. You, you really need to un unmount that destination data store before you copy it, regardless of the copy mechanism. Even if, it, even if it's a window where there's no active backup, or, so let's say I leave a window, yep. say an hour before, an hour after, where no backups allowed, no consolidations allowed, and I take a book, and I take a point in time from one of those, would, I, would you say I get a clean one if it's not active? Or? I would say there's a real good chance of that, but again, I can't guarantee that, right? So, right, so that, that's gonna take a little experimentation. That would be my advice. Test it out a few times before you implement it in production. Thank but, you. But, but, but I, based on what you said, I, that, that sounds like a pretty good theory. That would probably work. How about over here, please? Is there a license I need for, to use this? Is there, what again? Is there a license? Uh, it's included with your vSphere license, other than essentials. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Back over here. Yeah, with respect to um, getting these snapshots that you talked about, yeah. um, on, with a Windows-based VM, I assume that you're using VSS and using that functionality to, to quiesce the VM? Correct. Okay. So what are you using on the Linux side to quiesce the VM? So there, there is a mechanism within VMware Tools that will do some, some file quiescing, right? Uh, but it's not going to be any type of application quiescing there. A little more limited. So it's, it's a, a file, I guess, that runs, it's like a script that you run I, before? I, I actually believe it's a driver. I, I, I'm not close enough to the folks that develop the VMware tools to understand exactly how they do that, but I believe it's some sort of a driver that is loaded with VMware tools that does that file level quiescing. Okay, and then uh, just qualifying question on what the last gentleman asked. Everything that you talked about, VDK, or excuse me, VDR um, 1.5, that is part of vSphere. With, whoa, <laughs> with vSphere 5, and I'm going to turn my mic off in case that's me. Wow. So what, what other questions? Say that, say that again. I missed that. I was <laughs> so VDR 2.0 is included with, uh, with vSphere 5. Okay. That, that's what I meant, VDR 2.0. Okay, so it's part of vSphere 5. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Uh-huh. How about back over here? All right. Two questions, actually. Um, concerning the integrity check jobs. Yes. When it hits the end of its window within its scheduling, does it stop it? No, or it will does resume. it lock it? That's, that's an improvement we made that I did not mention. So if it stops, it will resume from the point that it stopped at when that maintenance, when that maintenance window okay, opens back up. So if it has not completed, it'll, it'll stop, let the backups run, and then fire yes. off or is it, it, its integrity check afterwards? Correct, yep. Okay, second part of my question. On the plans of building the backups, are they going to put a checkbox on there to start on next cycle? Because notoriously, I end up working after hours, <laughs> which ends up starting it, and as soon as I hit that finish, that backup is firing off, regardless of the state of the machine. Um, I, I don't know if that's part of the next plan release or not, but that's good feedback to take back to the, uh, the product management folks, so thank you for that. Even if they just put the checkbox in, I mean, no offense, every other backup product I've used, you can put it in on hold. Yeah. This one comes right out of the gate with it turned on, you're right. Yeah. Yep. And I don't know how many times I've had it fire off yep. unexpectedly. Understood. Good feedback. I'll take that. Thank you. How about over here? Uh, kind of a two-parted. Have you guys done any testing with Vue? 
not for test not for backing up link clones, but for backing up master images, that kind of thing. I have not tested that personally. Uh -huh, okay. I'm speculating, and again, I highlight that I'm yeah. speculating here uh, with regular virtual machines, right? Full VMDKs, not link clones, like you said. Yeah. Uh, I I can't imagine why that would not work. I've run because into because it talks to vCenter, right? And as yeah. long as vCenter is aware yeah. of that VM, yep. then that could potentially work. I've run into a problem recently where the master image, when it's on, cannot be backed up, but if it's oh, off, it can. Okay, interesting. And I'm not sure if that's view kind of the way it's grabbing the snapshot that Could it uses be. to deploy the pool. But even if the, the pool isn't actively provisioning, it's still ha I'm running into troubles backing up. If I leave it on by mistake and go home for the weekend, it doesn't get backed up. I, and ev every backup fails on it gotcha. until I shut it off. I don't, so I don't know if you had reports of that. That yeah, is the I, old version, so maybe the new version will be better. I don't know. but. Yeah, I'm not sure on that, and I, and I think you're right. I think partially if, if, that, if that master is in use somehow, there's probably some type of a lock on there that might uh, keep you from being able to snapshot that, that VM, right, which is certainly part of the backup process that VDR uses. But the snapshots that VDR is using are completely separate from the snapshots that you take in Snapshot Manager from vCenter, correct? Not entirely. Really not entirely? Slightly different, but, but same mechanism. So if you have some kind of weird, funky thing going on with snapshots in general on a VM, might that cause... VDR to stop functioning correctly? Absolutely. I did, have, I did run into something specifically where it kicked off a backup while I was creating a snapshot of a VM. Yep. And that corrupted snapshots for that VM for quite a while. Yikes. <laughs> I yep. don't know what happened, but it left a VDR snapshot process. Like when it takes the first snapshot to do the backup, it names one. And that name stuck and stayed in the snapshot manager until I deleted it. Yikes. Okay. No, that's good to know. I, I would, uh, if that happens again, uh, did you open up an SR on that by any chance? No, I didn't. Go, please do that the next time, so okay. that way we can get that back into the development folks so they can see that behavior. Okay. Um, I, I think officially VDR is not supported for view desktops. Doesn't okay. mean it won't work, right? Yeah. Um, but that, that's kind of the disclaimer, right? That, that yeah. it, it may or may not work. You may see some issues like what you're talking about. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Another question over I, here? Uh, I have a customer, actually. Uh, we have an application that runs on the VM. But uh, when our application is running, that's a disk. I mean, we, basically, our service is running doing nothing. But when he does a backup using VDR, he gets an error saying that uh, there is a lot of I.O. going on, and because of which the snapshot step, the very first step, fails. And I haven't been able to repro it in-house, but he has been complaining about that. You would. I don't know what we are doing incorrect. You know, all I'm yep. doing is querying the volume list. But what I found out is that when I query the volume volumes on the VDR on on the VM, there are two new volumes that show up. You know, th those are letterless volumes. Uh -huh. So, do you think if we query while those letterless volumes come up, and we kind of, I mean, we are not locking those additional volumes that show up. But um, there's something between me querying just the file system, you know, to get the letterless volumes that causes it. So would yep. you? So, I, so I've seen that issue before, especially with 1.x versions of VDR. Okay. Uh, I would try again with 2.0. There are also a couple of KB articles out there around that. I don't, I don't have the absolute uh, solid uh -huh. fix for you. Uh, as I mentioned to the last gentleman, too, if you see that again, using VDR 2.0, please open up a support request, and let's make sure we get that into VMware support so we can okay. track that if that's a, a bug or whatever and get that fixed right away. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, so there are VSS writers that are installed, right, with Exchange in there. And we have a VSS provider, if you will, in VMware Tools. It's not a perfect one. So again, it doesn't go all the way down to trunking logs, for example. But it has the ability, depending on which application and VSS writer that is built into that virtual machine, of using that, right? So in that particular case, it was talking to that, that writer for Exchange. And it was able to do some, some level of quiescing for, for that Exchange backup. But there was no agent installed. Um, I would, what's that?
Well, no, you cannot. And that's what exactly what I was going to mention, right? That's probably the, one of those, those applications that I was talking about where it probably makes sense to use a more enterprise level backup tool that is specific to Exchange. So that way you can restore individual mailboxes and potentially avoid the issue, right? Because in VDR2, snapshots are still taken, depending on if it's a shared data store or not. There's a hot add mechanism that happens for that SCSI disk. So no, no different behavior than VDR1.0 other than general performance improvements. But the overall workflow is the same. So my advice to you is find something that's made specifically to backup Exchange. But you can backup other VMs in your environment with VDR.